Police Engineering Team at the Wikimedia Foundation. Is your uh, <laughs> and, uh, I'm Dan Duvall. Well, also, I work for the Police Engineering Team. Um, yeah. So thanks for coming to this talk. It's uh, going to piggyback um, nicely onto the Kubernetes talk because it has to do not just with the platform on which we eventually um, run our production stuff, but also the way that your changes in code um, or the developers, if you're not a developer, with the way they get their changes in code to the production cluster. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> if we want to go on the presentation, um, so we'll so, take yeah. questions afterwards. Uh, at the end, yeah. and um, yeah, we've been working on this for about a year, a little over, mm -hmm. a little over a year, and uh, it'll be good to present it, get feedback, see what you all think. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, right now the naming is a little confusing because we keep referencing it as different things in different places. So in annual planning, I believe it's still called streamlined service delivery. Uh, we casually call it the continuous delivery pipeline or the release pipeline. These are all pretty synonymous. Uh, the reason it's it mentioned services now is that is our primary, or our initial use case because we thought services represented a unique opportunity and, and an easy first use case um, to be able to put through such a pipeline. Uh, Kubernetes sort of assumes that your application conforms, as Alex said in his talk, uh, conforms to certain parameters um, to be able to be run in such an environment. So, yeah, same thing. So yeah, some of the goals of uh, this pipeline. We had uh, we had problems, as Alex mentioned in his talk, with um, uh, as a developer, what do you have to do to get your code running in production? And the answer to that is it's complicated. And I don't think the answer should be it's complicated. Um, so primarily, why the pipeline is for developer empowerment. Um, also, we have a lot of different clusters currently. We have well. Uh, a laptop, which is a completely different environment. <laughs> and then we have the CI cluster, which is a completely different environment. And then we have beta cluster, which is a completely different environment. And then we have production. And if anybody wants to stand up their own environment to test things, it may be completely different than all of those environments. So environment parity is a big problem, as it is everywhere. Um, so that's an, another reason why we wanted to continue to have, or we wanted to create a solution that empowers developers and allows uh, environment parity. Um, also, the feedback cycles uh, for developers are pretty long, uh, especially for things that shouldn't necessarily take so long. So, uh, for instance, if you want to run, uh, you know, unit tests should be fast, and then you should get those results back. And if your unit tests pass, then you should be able to run your integration tests, get those results back. And then you should be able to integrate with other services, other uh, or exercise services via uh, from MediaWiki and get those results back maybe a little bit later, but uh, still within a reasonable amount of time. Uh, and the longer those feedback cycles are, the less the develop uh, the less the developer is engaged with the code that they're writing. So uh, if a developer is writing a piece of code and it takes a long time before they realize, well, it doesn't integrate with with this other extension or this other service very well, um, but you wrote it a month ago, uh, that's not useful information. Uh, and the final thing is reproducibility uh, and deployment confidence. So if we have problems in production, uh, currently, I mean, they, they just may not have, uh, if there may be an environmental parity re reason for that. Uh, if we have problems in CI, it may be a CI environment problem. I'm sure everyone's aware of that. <laughs> so uh, reproducing test results uh, and reproducing errors that ha come up in production is a big uh, reason why the pipeline. And you want to talk about this? Yeah. So um, this image was made years ago, but it essentially sort of uh, outlines like what your general um, strategy is when testing in software, and that's sort of to work from the inside out. You test like you know more atomically your functions, what the inputs should be, uh, or what the output should be given certain inputs, and then you test those uh, functions together. Then you test those components together, and then you test maybe the full stack of the application, and then maybe you test your application and parts of the system in which it runs. Uh, and this kind of shows, illustrates that along with the compu computational costs and the feedbacks associated with that type of testing. Because the more of the stack you're exercising in your test, the more computation that's going on, 
and the longer the delay in feedback from when you initiate the test to when you see the result. Um, and so in the pipeline, we, we tried to keep this, this basic strategy and this basic model in mind um, in that like we could start testing software uh, in the most core of ways in the very beginning. And as, you're, as the code gets promoted through the pipeline, we can test it in um, increasingly different uh, modes and using different strategies. So yeah, uh, what is the pipeline? Uh, the pipeline is uh, how you promote uh, application images, which are packages of your application through an immutable progression. Um, and it uses uh, the same testing strategy that I just <coughs> outlined, which is uh, the greater computational complexity, um, things are, are pushed off until we get feedback. So we can get feedback faster to developers. This is what it looks like <laughs> when you when you dump uh, all of that all of those thoughts into a diagram, and this diagram has gotten a lot of mileage. Um, <laughs> we we built this at uh, uh, all hands, to like years however, ago? yeah, years ago. years ago, two years ago, I think. something like it was that. two years ago. <laughs> I hope it was two years ago. Yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah. So uh, we're going to be going over the the stages of the pipeline. It's complex, but this is this is the basic progression that. Uh, an application would take to get to production, but most of this is uh, developers uh, don't have to understand it in like a huge amount of detail. Uh, but this is the progression that, that things will go through on their way to uh, deployment. And you can also see represented visually like that same these sort of feedback loops in this model sort of uh, also correlate loosely to the overall testing strategy and the feedback delays. Yeah, so, <laughs> uh, so this brings us to one particular tool that we implemented for the deployment pipeline, which is called Blubber. Um, it was named such that it has to do with wrapping, uh, wrapping Docker in a nice, happy layer of necessary fat. Um, <clears throat> and it was necessary for a few different reasons uh, that we identified when we looked at Docker files. Um, We'll get to the details of them in the next slides, but we saw opportunities for more efficiency uh, in the way that Docker likes to cache things. It's kind of opaque to the user of Docker, we felt, uh, and so we wanted to be able to make that more deterministic uh, in the pipeline when testing application changes. Um, security, people kind of think like, okay, once I'm in a container, I can do whatever I want and it's totally fine. Uh, we don't feel that way, I think there are certain security models in Linux that have been uh, followed and certain security models with deploying web applications that should still generally be followed even within a container. Um, and then empowerment, which is essentially, we wanted to be able to have uh, developers um, provide a configuration for exactly the type of environment that they wanted their software to run in. But we saw giving them full access to Docker files not only as an additional sort of um, learning curve, because you have to understand all the idiosyncrasies, um, but also not, um, not really the most desirable approach when it comes to running things in production. Um, yeah, again, we want to make sure that uh, the answer to how do I deploy an application into production isn't go talk to all these teams, it's yeah. you know, follow these guidelines, write this stuff, and it will be deployed to production. Uh, Docker files are full of unnecessary complexity to that end. And so we wrote a wrapper around that, which is, which is as Dan was explaining. So, so yeah, this is the first step in the, in the pipeline zoomed in a little bit. So this is what a normal developer will do uh, when working on their code. They'll uh, iterate on the development branch uh, and get uh, and push to Jenkins when they're, when they're happy with the local uh, working on this, and this is was touched on in Alex talk a little bit about how you will do this locally, which is hopefully Minikube uh, and, and Helm, so it, it mirrors this whole uh, progression as we go. But once it enters the, the Jenkins pipeline, what we'll do is, um, uh, well, we'll explain it, but yeah, Blubber will uh, run the build uh, process and eventually uh, publish that to a registry, but we'll go into more detail in the next slides. Yeah, so what Blubber does with efficiency is um, 
Well, it tries to be a lot more simple. Um, Docker files are idiomatic to say the least, or esoteric would be a better word possibly. Um, I say, Docker files suck. <laughs> <laughs> we wanted to let you say. Um, <laughs> And yeah, it's it's just it's really hard to know like what is Docker going to do with this? What's going to be the result of this? Uh, a couple of different examples is the copy command always copy stuff as root, and, and that seems totally backwards to how you write it. And then also like it assumes that the text of a command hashed is a good identifier for its deterministic result, um, which is a little weird. Um, so we wanted to sort of wrap that all up. Um, so Blubber knows about these things, and it can provide to the user an interface for declaring a simple uh, YAML configuration, and then doing all the necessary things under the hood. And it also supports multi-stage builds, so if uh, any of you don't know what that is, it's a, essentially a strategy that seemed to grow organically in the Docker community, or in the container community, which was the idea that you should be able to build your application in one container and just take the artifacts from that container into a new clean like production container to not have to ship all the development dependencies and all the other crap that comes along with um, your application when you're doing testing and other things like that. So Blubber also supports that. And for security, uh, it enforces, I talked a little bit earlier about how once you're in a container, it's the tendency is just to go crazy and do whatever you want. Um, Blubber tries to enforce a simple security model without too much input from the user. Um, and that is to, uh, the only thing that the user, the, the developer in this case, can influence that happens as root or writes any files as root is system package installation. So in the Blubber config, you will specify your system packages that you want. Other than that, you can't like specify any arbitrary commands that get run as root and result in root on files that could essentially execute as root when the containers run. Um, then it drops privileges to a somebody. Uh, the reason it's called somebody is that nobody usually doesn't have a shell, and this is <laughs> the one difference between that is it's uh, nobody with a shell, um, and it owns the ends up owning the application files. Does the um, dependency installation, so like node modules or pip packages or Ruby gems and that, that kind of thing. Um, and it ends up owning those files too, and then it drops privilege one more time before specifying the entry point so that the application is run as a different user than the owner of the application files. And as far as empowerment goes, well, I, we said earlier that you can provide the configuration, so you have control over what happens in that environment. Developers specify system dependencies, uh, entry points, package management stuff. You define what your test entry point is, and hopefully you are able to deploy in the end. So that's three developers. So naturally, we had to include <laughs> this GIF. <laughs> We were really just trying to get this gift into the... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we did it, so... Success. So, thanks. <laughs> you can all go now. <laughs> um, yeah. Do you want to talk about that? Sure, yeah. This is uh, uh, what a Blubber config file looks like. So, uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with what Docker files look like, but they're whatever. They're like shell scripts, but uh, someone who really loved basic or something. And, and they're, you can do whatever you want and rearrange things wherever you want. And things that look good are usually wrong. <laughs> so it looks nice in a Docker file, you're doing it wrong usually. Um, so we wanted something that looks nice and was right. <laughs> uh, and we think this looks right. So um, we're going to be talking about all the individual pieces. But this is a, a pared down a little bit, but this is pretty much how it what Mathoid is using um, and is currently running in production uh, and using. Uh, so you can see, like, we let them define app packages. Um, they install node requirements from their node requirements files. Um, they have a test entry point, and they can define the entry point for their test. Um, and, and yeah, that's uh, what's running through the pipeline currently for Mathoid. Yeah. So you might have seen in this previous slide these yeah, variants. Sure. So what the heck are these things? Um, well, we identified, of course, that environmental parity is super important. Uh, you want to have almost as much, 
you know, you want to have the environments to be identical as much as, as possible. Um, but some things are always different. So in development, of course, you're not going to be running as many processes. Maybe you won't be doing the same kind of logging. Um, and maybe there are slight differences in your dependencies. So we did want to provide a way to um, specif specify those differences without compromising the entire, um, the entire achievement of getting that uh, degree of parity. So that's what variants are for. Um, what do they look like? Well, you saw them in the last slide, but here's a pared down version of that. Um, a variant, well, yeah, these names don't totally matter. Like, they're pretty flexible. You can define a variant, give it a name, you use it as an include later or something. But we do have a couple conventions that we use in the service pipeline script, which is we expect a test variant and we expect a production variant. And those are the two things that pretty much have to be there if it's going to work through the service pipeline. Um, but there are other um, things you can do outside of that um, for whatever your need is. And in this case, you can see that the, um, there's configuration at the top level. And then the variant actually specifies additional uh, configuration items, um, some of which are overwritten, some of which are merged. We're going to fix that weird discrepancy and make it so that anything specified in the variant is actually overwrites completely the base, because that makes a lot more sense, I think. Um, but yeah, it makes for a much smaller uh, configuration, and I think easier to follow, hopefully. <laughs> so yeah, uh, if you want to talk about um, how variants uh, work for uh, variants how. <laughs> So uh, in this instance, we have three variants. The build variant, which you saw in the last slide, which uh, is it's worthwhile to note that it includes things like build essential. Like, why do you want build essential in your production container? You probably don't, but we will use it for npm install, for instance. Uh, npm sometimes has to compile uh, binaries uh, when you run npm install. So we need build essential, and it needs to be consistent across containers. Um, and so in that way, we can, we can inherit all that into the test uh, variant. Uh, but what we, and we do that by saying includes, includes is a, a list so you can uh, include from multiple variants and that gets complicated. Uh, but in this case, the only thing we're overriding after we've included everything from the build variant is the enter point. Uh, for test, well, what we run on the pipeline is basically uh, Blubber, we point to the config and we say test. And that gives us uh, all we need to build uh, the test variant of the image. Uh, in, at the end of the pipeline, we just run that test variant. Um, for prep, you can see it includes build, uh, but it over, this is a prep for the production build. So instead of running npm install with all of the dev dependencies, we run with environment production. Um, so it's pared down, uh, but it, it still includes all of the all of the, uh, you know, build essential and everything else. Um, but this is, yeah, next is what we'll talk about. <laughs> yeah. what, how we get rid of build essential at the end. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you can see another level of this. You, uh, this is a pretty common pattern, too, we're seeing with, like, uh, Blubber files for services, is to have, like, a build variant, a test, a prep, which is build but with production settings. And then you can see this copies instruction. And what is that? That is the multi-stage support that we talked about before. Um, you're not actually including the prep variant. You're just copying artifacts from it into your production image. And that production image is probably based on a much more slim image. Um, and it's not going to include all of the crazy development dependencies, built essentials, and all that stuff. And this gives real um, pretty substantial savings. Like, for example, the Mathoid image built, uh, the test variant of the Mathoid image is, I think, 800 megs, and the production one is 300. So that's a pretty big difference when you're shipping around big blobs all over the place to, um, to Kubernetes. So hopefully that will streamline things on that end. So yeah, so your image is built by Blubber. Now what happens in the pipeline? Um, we'll talk a little bit about that. 
So this is uh, what the pipeline looks like currently for Mathwood. Uh, this is a screenshot of our Jenkins install. Uh, and yeah, it's, uh, and also we have the Blue Ocean skin on our Jenkins install, so it looks fancy. Uh, <laughs> looks nice. Yeah, so you can actually, so it looks like a pipeline, as a matter of fact. Um, and yeah, we'll run through all of what it's what it's doing, but you can watch each of these steps as it as it moves through, as a change set moves through the pipeline. So yeah, the breakdown of what it's actually doing is um, we still have Zool, uh, so you push up a patch set and Zool triggers it triggers the uh, entry point to the pipeline and passes in all of your you know how to get your patch and Zool merger that sort of thing. Uh, so basically, we check out the code. <laughs> we check out the code. Uh, and we build the test variant, as we discussed earlier. We run the entry point of the test variant, which if you remember from the previous slide, is NPM test. Uh, then we build, if that passes, then we build the production variant of that. Uh, from there, we're running a verify step, which is uh, deploying to uh, local Kubernetes, which right now is Minikube, but uh, we're hoping, that's why we're like, that package is weird, um, <laughs> in the last presentation, if you were in it. but. Uh, yeah, basically we deploy to a mini Kubernetes um, and we run Helm test against it, which is currently running uh, the service checker. So it exercises endpoints from another pod to make sure that not only do the unit tests pass, but once we deploy this uh, image of your application to a production-like environment, uh, is it going to respond? Is it just going to fall over? Is there, uh, is there some way to exercise it as a user would exercise it? Um, and that's the Helm test. Um, and then once, if that passes, we currently push that produ uh, production image to the production registry, which is uh, from whence it, uh, it can be deployed. And so this, this part might be a little mysterious, hopefully not so much after you, if you did go to previous talk, um, but Helm is always like, whenever I mention Helm to someone, they're like, wait, what? Exactly. Does it do? How does it interact with things? So, um, we wanted to highlight this portion of it and uh, just sort of like give you the zoomed-in diagram of what that's actually doing. Um, and it's actually taking so it's taking the image that was built using Blubber and Docker build, um, and it's taking a chart. If you don't know much about charts, you can find someone and ask them about that. But essentially, a chart is what glues together Kubernetes re uh, resources. Uh, well, the images with the Kubernetes resources uh, responsible for running those and setting up uh, ingress, network ingress, and all the other stuff that an application uh, ecosystem needs to run. Um, so, yeah, once the image is successfully built, the test entry point is, ex is executed. Um, then it takes that chart and it takes the new image ID and it deploys that image using the chart to Minikube. Um, then, yeah, Tyler already explained all this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, step on your toes. No, 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 that's cool. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then after this stage, uh, we don't quite know. That's where we're in uncharted territory um, with that because that's the next part of what we're working on with SRE um, and services is like, what does the next part of this pipeline look like? Yeah, that's mostly it for our talk because the pipeline isn't done but we are working really hard on it at the end of this quarter uh we're hoping to what are we hoping to do with this <laughs> <laughs> annual planning yeah we're um, hoping to do more annual planning at the end of this quarter <laughs> um <laughs> so uh yeah this is uh, the current image that's running mathoid in production um so you can download this right now on your laptop um and tag subject to change, but if you download this, this is exactly what's running. And then if you next, there's oh, one yeah. more slide. Yeah. yeah, there are two more. And if you combine that with the, the chart that you find at releases.wikimedia.org slash charts, um, there, therein is the Mathoid chart. You can deploy it to your local Kubernetes. Um, and currently, I think these charts are tuned for uh, development, local stuff. So it's not like the values are running with in production, but you can deploy it to Minikube locally. That's how CI does it. Uh, and yeah, and then the next step is deployment, which I didn't know how that works, but it's something like that. We're gonna assume it's just a single command. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah.
That's pretty much it. Yeah. So, um, we'll just open it up to questions or comments from anybody. Concerns, general terror at this approach. It's one small thing, uh, Dr. Registry, does it meet up with the key 404, like the main page? Yeah, the main That's page it. will 404. Um, I don't know. There's no plans. <laughs> I, I found a fabricated ticket, and yeah. I can answer that. Don't expect it to be not returning that 404 anytime soon. It is the Docker on uh, the Docker reference registry from Docker, and it is uh, meant to do that. It has APIs, and if you actually use it with the Docker command, it's gonna uh, correctly respond. But it's not meant for human consumption by a browser. Is there any place for the I always do curl. <laughs> right. Curl docker registry that we made at org slash v2 slash underscore catalog. <laughs> yeah, I pipe that to JQ and then I grep. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's, I don't understand. <laughs> What's perfectly <wrong>? usable. <laughs> so the human consumption part would be if you have docker on your laptop or in a VM or something, you would do docker pool. Yeah. Docker registry, you need a dash registry, you need a roll. Yeah, go back to the URL. You if you did Docker pull this, you'd get Matthoid. Uh, and yeah, there's no break line in it. It should all just be on one line, but slides are only so wide. So I'm sorry. <laughs> I can show it. Did you have to change anything in Matthoid itself to get it ready for Kubernetes, or was it just external? Uh, Marco, we did we have to? Yeah. No, yeah. uh, we had to add a file. <laughs> we added a file that uh, the pipeline consumes, which is the Blubber file, and that was it. I think that was the only pull request I made against Mathway for this project. Oh, and a Helm.yaml that has a single value that says use this chart. Yeah, to tie the chart together with the. Thing. Since the charts are distributed on the, by um, on releases So does that mean if you have one completely done, then? Putting the other ones, other services in, should be fairly quick. In theory. Yeah, <laughs> I know uh, Alexandros has done Graphoid well in the two days that we've been here, but that's also an unearthed a fair amount of, of changes we'd like to make while we were doing that. Yeah. So I imagine it'll be uh, slowish going initially and probably faster as we get, gain more experience and moving, migrating services. But yeah. I think the biggest next challenge is going to be, because Mathoid and Graphoid are both like single uh, service things. They don't really depend on other services all that much. So once we have something that depends on rest base um, or like uh, state stateful services in the Kubernetes cluster, I think it's going to be an additional level of challenge, but nothing that Helm it, um, shouldn't be able to address. But we wanted to start with like the most simple use case just to prove the overall process of the pipeline. Yeah. Mobile apps, by the way, is not a bad candidate. Mm -hmm. All right. I'll be angry. How much time do we have? Uh, a lot of time. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I could show the grotesque yeah, output of, of Blubber. Sure. Um, the stuff you're not supposed to see. Well, maybe we didn't show that. <laughs> <laughs> but like a demo of like, pull it, yeah, you could pull oh, down the, shit. the whatever, deploy it's it to a crazy cluster. Yeah, okay. <laughs> So uh, by end of next fiscal, we're trying to get all the services migrated, and then we're going to spend the following fiscal working on MediaWiki stuff. So I'd be better position to answer that question then. <laughs> but away, that's R roughly you think like okay, the next year we'll get all the MISC services stuff yeah. kind of pulled into this model, and then figure out what the next step from there is. Yeah. Big enough. 
So I'm starting a mini cube right now. It uh, takes longer than I think it should, but I'm impatient. But once this is started, yeah, I can show you the output of, well, I'll show you the blubber file in its entirety and then what the Docker file output of that is uh, and then what piping that to Docker looks like. Am I, let me make sure I'm actually, Oh, I'm still on your uh, MiFi. Is that all right? <laughs> I guess so. I'll be working from the phone in my pocket. I, I can pull darker images now. Yeah, sure, do it. <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah, great. I'll send you the bill for this talk. Great. <laughs> oh, and you're roaming, by the way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So this is the Docker file. Uh, it's basically, yeah, this is the one in its entirety. We did take a couple things out um, for the slides just to like fit it. What's that? Can you make that bigger? Oh, sure, yeah. Is that all right? No, I, it's I guess it's just because it's so, because of the back background maybe. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's kind of low contrast, so even though it's the same font size as what you showed before, it's, yeah. yeah. That better? Yeah. Cool. Make it a little wider. Here we go. Yeah, so uh, we have a version field, which is just a control, like if we were to change anything in this configuration that you get um, a validation error really quickly that tells you like it's the wrong format of the configuration. Um, we do have a fair amount of validation in it, which is nice in Blubber, so it, it gives you happy error messages. Hopefully. Um, yeah, if, if you have bad values in here. Uh, oh, some things about Blubber. It's written in Go. Uh, the re there are reasons. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> oh. um, we were thinking about, well, this tool will probably need to be distributed to everyone. Um, there's we also did distribute it. We did, yeah. <laughs> if you go to, where is that slide? The very last one. Probably at the end, maybe like 25. Yeah. Oh, well, good guess, I guess. Yeah, yeah so um, Blubber is available at this URL. So yeah, we cross-compiled it. So this is one of the reasons we decided to use Go, because we're, developers are going to have to use Blubber on their laptops. Um, and so without installing the whole Go tool chain, you can run Blubber on your laptop. Um, right now, they're just distributed there. We need to find a better place for it. We just put it up last night at the Hackathon. So there are checksums and, and, uh, and binaries in that directory. There's yeah. a, yeah. The Plan 9 one for people for who are running Plan 9. The whole thing. <laughs> and let me just check on this. Yeah, and the other reason um, we were thinking was, well, the entire, like, all the tooling for the ecosystem is written in Go. So Docker's stuff is written in Go, Kubernetes is written in Go, Helm is written in Go. So there are advantages to that. For instance, um, in Blubber, some of the validation actually does check your uh, base image URL against the same exact patterns that Docker validates those URLs against, just like minor things like that. If we do want to have Blubber actually actuate or make calls to the Docker daemon, then we can just import Docker into the project instead of shelling out and making sure and sort of like delegating the responsibility for all that version control to the user, um, things like that. And hopefully, if this tool proves, you know, generally viable for others, um, you know, hopefully that same sort of developer community can uh, embrace the project. We, well, I, yeah, I think there's probably a more likelihood if it's written in the same language as the other tool. There it is. Okay, so Minikube is up. And let me just quickly make sure that I have the newest version of Blubber. I don't know if you want the newest version. <laughs> but anyway. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, too late. <laughs> we did change some things. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So 
So you just run blubber against, I'll just show you the usage statement. Um, it, hopefully that's big enough. Uh, it's a little bit small. Um, I'll make this bigger. Well, all right. Yeah, so you give it the configuration file and then a variant name, and that's essentially it. You'll see this um, policy option here. We did develop support for policy files. Um, so if anyone, such as SRE, wants to ensure that you are not doing really crazy stuff in there, uh, we mostly ensure that you can't do absolutely crazy stuff. We do have one flag <laughs> called runs insecurely. Um, so, which is so don't do that. <laughs> yeah, because that's which, really the, the secret to the security <laughs> is that you don't specify that flag. Um, it's mostly meant for test suites that assume they have act, a lot more read write access to the, like the project files and directories. Um, so we can enforce that on just the test variants. Tests do like yeah. seem to sprinkle around files in your project. Yeah. So doc yeah. generators too. Right. Things, exactly. Uh, you might actually want to use the version of Blubber that is packaged uh, and distributed. Because we haven't updated the Mathoid uh, Blubber it. file, and we did a lot of hacking on Blubber at the hackathon. <laughs> so well, installing the latest version of, of Blubber from the source repository is probably not good. That's no fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that one's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like if you want to ensure that oh, the demo goes horribly. We could do this. <laughs> all right, all right. Jeez, can't type up here. Cool. All right, so there it is. And we'll run it against dist pipeline blubber.yaml, which is where we currently expect the blubber configuration to be. That can change. We've already had somebody come to us and say, why are you doing this? That's where Python likes to install right. wheels. Um, so this was just something that we came up with with services. So we can either make the pipeline script allow for different locations or we can agree on a different convention. And I'm going to show you what the output looks like, which <laughs> looks beautiful. What a beauty. Um, <laughs> so you can see I'm generating the test variant. I'll show you the test. Um, variant right here. It includes build, so it uses the Node.js development base image. It includes some app packages that are necessary for dev dependencies. It tells Node to uh, install those. This configuration is now different in the current version of Blubber. We've changed it slightly. Um, and yeah, what that looks like in the Blubber file is that it's using the base image. It's uh, doing the like user privilege level that we talked about. Um, that's sort of model of dropping privileges. So as root, it's running all the app packages, uh, Debian packages. It's creating a couple users, the somebody user and the run user. It's dropping privileges to somebody, setting the working directory to what's specified in the file, setting some environment variables that are necessary for getting the application to run or to build. It's taking care of these esoteric uh, Docker things, such as the fact that copy is usually, usually results in root owned stuff unless you specify otherwise. So it makes sure it's applying the current uh, run level user to that. It's uh, installing <laughs> node modules separately from copying over application files. That is a cache a, uh, optimization, essentially to ensure that changing some random application file does not result, result in an NPM install every time the uh, image is rebuilt. So it does that in two stages. So yeah, as you're working locally, if you change uh, a file in your project that isn't package.json, it's not gonna reinstall all the NPM dependencies, it's not gonna install app dependencies, it's just going to copy over your stuff. And right. that's it, it'll take a sec second. Um, yeah, and then it's um, copying over the application files. It's dropping uh, to the run user again, and then it's specifying more environment variables and the entry point, and adding a couple of nice labels so that we can track uh, images and know how they were generated. And normally, Blubber version isn't just plus. 
Yeah. Normally. <laughs> Which is fixed to the latest master, I swear. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, who knows? Just how you compile it is yeah. how it's fixed. Right. So, yeah, this generates a Docker file, which we then just pipe to Docker build. Um, Docker build handles the, the creation of the image um, that we then uh, run for the entry point. Uh, it's all cached on my machine. So, yeah. it went we did this at some point. Yep. <laughs> but I can show you if you were to change um, the README, it wouldn't do everything over again. It wouldn't do NBM install all over again um, and all that. Yeah. So, yeah, you want to run the test entry point? Should I? You just run that container? Sure. Yeah. All so, right. this is what the pipeline does for tests. Uh, effectively, with a little bit. What did I call it? Is it going to blow up? Probably. <laughs> there you go. That's it. And I could do the same thing with the production one. And you can see these two commands that just popped up, those are actually doing the multi-stage. So they're copying the application files and the installed node modules over from the, um, the prep image. <coughs> now it's completed, so we can do... Don't forget the P. Yeah. Uh, is that right? Yep. Cool. So I'll run that there. And in another window, hey buddy, get over here. I will attempt to use curl. Oh, well. I will say minikube, show me. The oh, yes. list. Show me where my stuff is running. Well, that's running on yeah. Docker and Minikube. Um, and I will query it. So, squared. Oops. Uh, what is it? Uh, SVG. SVG. We'll do that one. <laughs> you don't want to see PNG output on the console. Oh, sweet. Because it's, uh, yeah, 144. Bling. There you go. <laughs> so, yeah, what we've done now is, uh, yeah, we built the test variant, the production variant, and we queried this, it, basically. Yeah. Yeah. All using the same configuration. All from blubber.yaml. I really think that's all we probably have. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> but if there are questions about that last, about the demo, shoot. Cool. Right. Well, thanks so much. Yeah. Yes? Is okay. this pipeline only in production? There's nothing in, on labs? This sort of similar? <coughs> you mean like in order to deploy to labs? Yeah. No, we don't. Um, I mean, yeah, this is something that we should probably talk a lot about more internally, how to maybe unify some of our tooling with ToolForge. Um, or, sorry, is that not the yeah, right name that's anymore? right. That's the right name. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, Brian. You didn't, you didn't heckle us, I think. Um, so, that yeah. Would be cool. Yeah, we can definitely have more conversations about that, what, what might be useful for them, what they have that's useful for us. Yeah. <laughs> I have a question. So, um, if I'm a service developer, uh, I use this. I create a Blubber file to uh, be able to test this fast and, and reproduce the test environment that is uh, also used on the uh, uh, CI. And if I'm a uh, lowly media wiki extension developer, I have to wait two years until everything is ready, yeah. right? Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah. That's what I want. No, it's fine. I know how hard it is. Yeah. It's just, yeah, it's a much bigger problem. And in uh, tackling that problem, we're finding intermediate problems that also need addressing. So. But we're working on it. Yeah. yeah. And ideally, like, the tooling that is developed will be more comprehensive and more um, able to address a lot more needs as we present things like this and, and uh, as we move into working fully on the media with I'm also sure we'll be probably changes that will be need, need to be done immediately. Like for example, yeah. the extension developer, you know very well that if your extension relies on another extension, well you have to do it manually right now. There is no version of the there's version of it. Yeah. Media wiki tooling will have to change to accommodate this. That's why it's gonna take two years. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah, the way that we're in Lubber able to delegate out to dependency managers, we need something to delegate to for media wiki essentially. Um, to be able to accomplish that same thing. And there are some proposals flying around, I think, about using Composer to do extended management. Yeah. yeah, we were in yeah. the RFC, uh, RFC discussion at the end of the yeah, day yesterday. yesterday. Yeah. yeah, we're trying to be active in that discussion so that we can make sure that the final solution there works for the final solution here. Cool. Well, thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.